A warm welcome to everybody who is here this morning. It's lovely to see some of you that, for various reasons, I've not seen myself for a very long time. Uh, and in fact, this is the only part of the service I I'm involved in today. I didn't even know that. But it is good to be back with you. And it is particularly good to welcome uh, the Reverend Hannah Alderson, who is behind me, who is the Lazenby Chaplain at the University of Exeter. Perhaps for us, more importantly, she's a very significant colleague of Simon's, who is in the gallery this morning, and we're grateful for him uh, standing in, in uh, there. But we're really, really pleased to have you with us again, Hannah, this morning. She's been here before, and we're grateful to you for being with us again uh, this August. Thank you so much for your warm welcome <clears throat> as ever, and thank you for having me back. I think um, folks at South Street know that if they invite me in an August, I'm almost certainly going to say, oh yes, please, because the university is so quiet this time of year. It is lovely to, um, to come and to see all of you during my slightly quieter period at the university. Um, a gentleman was asking me before the service what on earth Lazenby Chaplain means. Um, so I thought I may as well explain that as, as I say hello to you all. Um, essentially, Lazenby Chaplain uh, is simply a title given uh, after the name of a benefactor back in the, I think it was the 1950s, who gave some money to the university to establish a chaplaincy. Uh, her name was Catherine Lazenby, and she thought that the, the chaplain should be uh, an Anglican, uh, a man of God, because uh, it would have been then. Um, uh, she thought that that should be a young man so as to um, relate better to the students, um, but a man who would also invite ecumenical colleagues to come and speak at the university. I don't know if, uh, if Catherine Lazenby were around now and could see what chaplaincy at the university looked like, whether she'd be surprised or not, because it's lovely to be part of a diverse, multi-faith chaplaincy team at the university, which of course uh, Simon is part of as well. But anyway, I digress. It's wonderful to uh, be here at South Street this morning and to be leading worship here. Let us begin with uh, a moment of prayer as we come before God in worship. Creator of all, we bring our offering of worship for all that you have made for us. Saviour of all, we bring our offering of worship for all that you have done for us. Spirit of all, we bring our offering of worship for all that you reveal to us. Three in one, we bring our offering of worship. Be the blessing among us now. Amen. In a moment, we're going to, um, to sing our first hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. And this is one of my, one of my favorite hymns. Um, I absolutely love um, the wording in it. Um, there is, is a word that appears in the third verse, ponder anew, ponder anew what the Almighty can do. And I think coming to church is, um, is an opportunity to, to ponder anew. So perhaps as we sing our hymn, that might be our prayer, that through our worship this morning, we might be able to ponder anew what the Almighty can do for us.
before we introduce our service theme, a word of prayer. Loving God, we pray that we may ponder you anew this morning <coughs> through a word we hear in our readings or that we sing in our hymns, a word spoken during the service or exchanged over coffee. We pray that we may come to know you and love you more today. For the love you have shown us since the moment we were born and the path you opened for us as your servants here on earth, for the footsteps we follow and the words we shall speak, the seed that we scatter as we walk your narrow way, for the harvest you shall gather on that great and glorious day. O oh Lord, to you we offer a sacrifice of praise. Amen. So I've, I've sort of titled what I'm going to say this morning, um, Watering the Garden, Keeping 21st Century Sabbath. I'll say a little bit more about watering the garden a little bit later. I've recently read a fantastic book by an American author called Rachel Held Evans. Uh, she died a couple of years ago in her mid-30s, but she was a really active person online, uh, writing and speaking about faith in the 21st century. The book that I read is called Searching for Sunday. Searching for Sunday. And it recounts the author's childhood growing up in the Bible Belt in America and her journey away from church as a young adult. And then her rediscovering of Jesus uh, when she reached her mid-twenties. Now, part of the book and her story that really interested me was her experience of how it felt to stop going to church on a Sunday morning. While she had been brought up with a very strict expectation that everybody should be in church on a Sunday, um, and that Sunday was for putting on your Sunday best and behaving properly and, and going to church, she instead found herself as a, as a 20-something uh, in her pajamas on a Sunday morning, sipping coffee in bed and watching TV. And actually, she says in her book that she felt all right about that. And yet, when she went out of the house on a Sunday, she would still feel that she ought to dress up in a skirt and heels so that if she bumped into anyone she knew, it would at least look like she'd been to church. Now, it made me start to wonder, what does Sunday mean to me? What kind of expectations have I grown up with about the day of Sunday? And I suppose it prompts me to ask you to wonder, what does Sunday mean to you? Both the day and what we do on it, and how our habits and routines, both on Sundays and on other days of the week, might achieve a biblical concept of Sabbath. For me, growing up, Sunday had a very clear routine. It was church in the morning, of course. My brother and I went to the local Baptist church with my mum because it had a Sunday school, while my dad went off to play organ at the parish church. And we all arrived home at around the same sort of time to the smell of beef or lamb or chicken cooking in the oven. Lunch was 1 p.m. always, and always a roast, and we were joined by our maternal grandparents who lived next door. Sunday afternoon was often given over to watching Formula One racing on the TV, when you could watch it on the TV without having to pay an arm and a leg. And in the evening, we'd go to my paternal grandmother's house in the next village. Sunday was for food, faith, and family. When UK law started permitting Sunday trading in 1994, 
my family were nonplussed because, they thought, who would need to go to the shops on a Sunday? They always did their shopping on a Tuesday. They wouldn't have dreamt of going near a shop on a Sunday. Of course, things are very different these days, and most likely I'll pop to a shop on the way home from here and get some milk because we've run out. In 1994, many people worried about Sunday trading, eroding our societal concept of Sabbath, with retail workers required to go to work on a Sunday, and people perhaps giving their Sundays over to shopping rather than relaxing at home. But more than just shop opening times have changed over the decades. Church going is down, and so are families eating together and extended families living near one another. And I suppose I'm sort of torn before, between feeling a bit sad about that and thinking, well, that's life. Things change. The way people live changes. It's perhaps not about how we do things, but that we continue to hold on to the concept of Sabbath, that rest, that spending time with people we love, and that worship are important for everyone, wherever and however we do it. The Bible, as we will see in a moment, is really clear about the concept of having, having a Sabbath. Growing up, for me, Sabbath was clearly the things that happened on a Sunday, going to church, eating, and seeing family. This morning, we are going to dig a little deeper into what Sabbath is in the Bible, and what it's meant to do, and then perhaps wonder, how can we achieve it? Both of our readings this morning mention Sabbath. So we're going to hear them now, and as we hear them, perhaps we'll wonder uh, how Sabbath is being described in these readings. So our first reading is from Isaiah, and our second is from Luke. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, starting at verse 9. Then you will call, the Lord will answer, you will cry for help, and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry, if you satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, your gloom shall be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. The ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You will be called repairer of the breach, restorer of cities to live in. If you refrain from tramping the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honourable, if you honour it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests or pursuing your own affairs, then you will take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Luke chapter 13. Sorry. Yep, yeah, chapter 13, 10 to 17. Jesus heals a crippled woman. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailments. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, 
There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all the opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he had said. Thank you so much to our readers. As we uh, ponder our readings, uh, we're going to have another hymn. Those using the hymn books can find uh, that. Uh, It's number 53 in our hymn books. We stand to sing King of Glory, King of Peace. You have granted my request, you have heard me. You have helped me when oppressed, you have spared me. We think about that woman in our second reading, how she must have felt to be freed from her suffering. Watering the garden, keeping 21st century Sabbath. Now, you'll have noticed that our readings today uh, both mention the Sabbath a great deal. Now, I know that um, being an Anglican, I know that Baptists like a three-point sermon, and it so happens uh, that there are three points about our readings this morning um, that I thought it would be good to focus on a little bit and to explore as we continue to think about how we keep Sabbath. The first thing is about the fact that we are expected to keep a Sabbath at all. The second is that Jesus probably wasn't very good at keeping Sabbath in quite the way he was expected to and what he says about that. And the third is about how we might take these readings and use them to help us think anew about Sabbath in our own lives. So first, that we are required to keep a Sabbath. 
Now, this sense of a real requirement is really clear in our Isaiah reading. The writer describes the Lord calling upon the people of Israel to refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day. The Sabbath is the Lord's day. It is not for people's own interests, but it is to be dedicated to the Lord. Now, of course, uh, Isaiah was written for uh, a Jewish audience. And of course, this commandment for observant Jews comes initially from the Ten Commandments, those foundational commands given to Moses on Mount Sinai, on which the identity and ethics of Israel are built. Exodus 20 describes this fourth commandment like this. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, I described earlier my um, typical childhood Sunday routine, and I'm sure you all have your own Sunday routines. But of course, for the Jewish writers and earliest readers of both our readings this morning, the Sabbath day was not Sunday, but Saturday the final day of the week, because as we have heard in our little segment from Exodus there, that was the day God rested after six days of creation. I'm sure many of us know Jewish people today who observe Sabbath from a few minutes before sunset on a Friday evening until sunset on a Saturday night, observing with prayer meals, rest, and family time. So how did this idea of Sabbath carry over to Christianity? Well, the earliest Christians continued to see themselves as Jewish and observed a Saturday Sabbath too, observing it in much the same way as they would have before, going to the synagogue and resting. But at some point in the first century, as Christianity gained its distinctive identity, observance switched to a Sunday. Justin Martyr, writing in the mid second century, explains why Sunday is Christianity's holy day. He says this, but Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because Sunday is the day on which uh, God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world, the first day. And Jesus Christ, our Saviour, on the same day rose from the dead. For he was crucified on the day before that of Saturn, and on the day after that of Saturn, which is the day of the sun, having appeared to his apostles and disciples, he taught them these things which we have submitted to you also for your consideration. So by that point of the second century, Sunday is the day that Christians are gathering together for worship. Now furthermore, in the year 321, Sunday as a rest day was formally instituted by the Roman Emperor Constantine I, who issued a civil decree stating, all judges and city people and the craftsmen shall rest upon the venerable day of the sun. So while we as Christians have come to observe a different day to our Jewish forebears, there is still this expectation that there should be a day for worship and rest. Although the earliest Christians, both Jews and Gentiles, felt called to move away from other Jewish laws, like food laws, this idea of a particular day of the week dedicated to God was sustained. I think there's quite a, a deep 
truth and helpfulness in doing this. But quite deliberately setting aside time and space for God, for rest and for recalibration is a good idea. And I think even in the secular world today, we see it, don't we? We see people talking about taking time out for uh, mindfulness and for meditation and for rest. There is a real realization that having time for rest is important. So what of Jesus' example? Because in our reading that we heard this morning from Luke, We see that Jesus is perceived as breaking Sabbath law by healing a woman on the Sabbath. That's seen as work. Now, I'm sure you'll know, uh, if you have read your Bible and, and heard your Bible in church, that this is not by any stretch the only time that Jesus is accused of breaking Sabbath law. There are, in fact, six different incidents recorded where Jesus is said to have healed on the Sabbath day. It is, in fact, such a common occurrence in our gospel stories as to make it feel perhaps a little bit deliberate. Was Jesus deliberately healing on the Sabbath day to make a point? Perhaps he was saying that the leaders of his time were being too legalistic about how people observed the Sabbath. And perhaps he was saying they were putting observance of the law over being compassionate to someone in need. In one story, Jesus' disciples are criticized for picking heads of grain on the Sabbath. And Jesus says in response to this criticism, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Or perhaps by healing on the Sabbath, Jesus was showing something about his own identity and his lordship. He is lord even of the Sabbath. In fact, Jesus says that in the same episode in the grain field. The son of man is lord even of the Sabbath. Ultimately, when we look at Jesus' stories of healing on the Sabbath, we're left with the feeling that how we keep the day, what we do and don't do, is perhaps less important than the purpose, the why we do what we do. Coming closer to God in worship. Perhaps also coming closer to our brothers and sisters, both our friends and perhaps our family, and those in need of help. It's really interesting that while the Hebrew Bible commands a Sabbath, even going as far in Exodus 31 as saying that people who work on the Sabbath day should be put to death, there isn't a huge amount of detail about what counts as work or rest. Certainly, Jesus, in his response to the leader's criticism, of him healing this woman with a curvature of the spine, seems to have a very different view about the nature of this activity than they do. This is not work, as the leaders believe. This, for Jesus, is an extension of worship in bringing joy and freedom to a person who has suffered for so long. Jesus indicates that even they who believe there should be no work at all on the Sabbath day would still untie an animal to lead it to water, indicating that there were, as there have always been, specific exceptions to the laws to attend to the welfare of animals and people. Jesus seems to be saying, well, why should this woman's ailment be any different? The passage ends with people rejoicing, having seen the wonderful things that Jesus is doing. It ends, ironically, with the very purpose of Sabbath being met. The leaders do not seem to recognize that the man standing before them, Jesus, is God himself. But somehow the crowd looking on seem to sense it, and they rejoice and they wonder at him. And what is the Sabbath for, if not for recognizing God and rejoicing and wondering 
at his goodness. Which brings me to the third point. How do we use the concept of Sabbath in our own lives? How do we use the idea of a day or a period of time dedicated to rest to stir up this wonder and rejoicing and renewed relationship with God in ourselves? Our Isaiah reading calls the Sabbath a delight, not a duty or a rule, not something to feel guilty about when we don't follow it quite as we ought, but a delight. So where do we go with this in our own walk with Christ? I think I would like to bring in three images here. The first is the foundation story of Sabbath, the creation story, the idea that we keep Sabbath because God who created the heavens and the earth kept Sabbath. After six days of creation, God rested And so should we. It is a reminder to find rest in our lives, to not feel guilty about rest and not to see rest as a luxury, to know that it is fundamental to human living. God created. And our Christian lives are all about creation, creating relationships, creating love, creating opportunities for ourselves and others, creating new ideas, creating new conversations. But all this creation requires an outpouring, and to give, we first need to receive. Even God, who made everything we can see around us, rested. To live our fullest lives, so should we. And in our 21st century society, which is so fast and busy, there is an extra imperative to do so, as countercultural as it might sometimes feel. Resting one day in seven, definitely. But also, I think, taking time out of each day to rest, which should include resting in God in a time of prayer. Our Isaiah reading says, you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. And I love that image of refreshment and filling up. That's our second image, a watered garden. Now I'm sure those of you who have been looking around a bit this month, perhaps those of you who have gardens or who walk in local parks, know what an unwatered garden looks like. We've all seen this yellow, dried up grass uh, as a result of our mostly hot and dry weather this month. And thinking about that reminds us that that's not how we want to be. We want to be like a watered garden. We want to be like a living thing that has taken time to be refreshed and renewed by God. And we get this refreshment and renewal by giving time to rest, to pray, and to spend time with loved ones. Doing so is not idleness, but essential filling up on what we need, that we might have the strength to do the Lord's work. The final image I would like to draw on is the image from our gospel story this morning. The woman who is healed. Because when she comes to Jesus, she is bent over, and she has been so for 18 years. We can imagine her posture and how it might have been really painful to look up. Maybe she has spent all of that time mostly staring at the floor. Jesus, on the Sabbath, gives her this miraculous gift of being able to raise her head and look up and around, raising her head high. And perhaps for the first time in 18 years, she can, without any pain or discomfort, see the sky, see the horizon, and see other people's faces. And I think that's what Sabbath can do for us 
when we keep it well. Sabbath is taking time out of our lives to take rest, take time for God and for others. It is about us stepping out of our routine and rhythms of our ordinary days and times. It gives us an opportunity to survey the scene, to look up and around and out. If our lives are like walking through valleys with difficult things, we might call a Sabbath, however we take it, as a mountaintop experience. When I was a curate in Somerset uh, a few years ago, I worked on, on quite a difficult estate with lots of everyday worries and struggles. And because I was a curate, a priest in training, every month, once a month, I used to drive to the city of Wells um, for a day of training. Now, it was about a, a half-hour drive, and always I used to get my best ideas about ministry when I went to Wells. Not necessarily because of anything that was said at the training session. Uh, there was something about a moving away, just for a day, from the everyday grind of life and allowing my mind and spirit some space. You might call it a bit of a retreat. You might call it a Sabbath. You might call it space to fill up, which is a rather neat thing to say, given that that particular space for me happened to be wells. It really did feel like raising my head and being able to look at my everyday life and ministry with proper perspective just for a day. Now, I don't think there is one way of doing Sabbath. I don't even think it necessarily has to be done on a particular day, although Sunday is when most churches meet. Often people do have jobs and responsibilities that mean that a whole day can't be dedicated to rest each Sunday. And from the example in our gospel story, I think God understands that. It's not about what we do and how we do it and being legalistic about that. It's that we do take the time for ourselves and for God, wherever that fits into our day or our week. Time for ourselves, time for others, time for God. So my encouragement to you all today, and indeed to myself, is to just think about where we might be able to find this concept of Sabbath in our own lives, whether in a traditional way, church, food, family, on a Sunday, or perhaps in a non-traditional way, a new way, a way that works in our lives. How might we search for Sunday in our own life? So continuing that sense of this gathering being our connecting with God along with our fellow Christians, we come to our prayers for others. And we take this opportunity for prayer. Let us pray together. Father, you have given us the gift and command of a Sabbath space. And we begin our prayers by asking for ourselves that you will help us to find such a space in our lives so that we may indeed be able seven whole days, not one in seven, to praise you so that our lives may know your protection as rear guard and vanguard so that you Lord coming to us may find our soul space open and ready for you unlatched and lit expecting 
that you would enter there. We thank you too that you have put it in our hearts to provide sabbatical space for our ministers where they can find renewal, reinvigoration, your presence and peace. We pray for them this week, this month, on holiday perhaps, on study leave, or even on duty so as to give their colleagues space. And with them we remember other members of our staff team enjoying space from their normal duties. We thank you, Father, for bringing Hannah to us this morning, and we pray for her and her chaplaincy colleagues. We think of this summer vacation not only as a time of quietness, but also as a hugely busy turnover time. And we especially pray about all that follows from the recent release of A-level results. Praying particularly for those for whom the future has become more uncertain and perhaps more frightening. And then, Father, we pray that there may be opportunity for a Sabbath space in the life of our country, a time when we can pause the onward rush of unexamined activity, space to reflect on the importance of truth, community, openness, and yes, love. May our country benefit from a Sabbath pause. And not our country alone, we are increasingly aware that we have been handling your gift of creation with brutal aggression, relentlessly squeezing every last drop of profit until creation itself cries out in pain. Father, will you give to human beings the insight to see that creation needs its Sabbath, its rest, and is to be given space for healing. But there are humans too who need a Sabbath space for healing. We think of those enduring unyielding pain, of others for whom the onward rush of health problems leaves no time for anything but fear. But then also we pray for those whose suffering seems interminable. And with them we think of the carers, sometimes young, sometimes old, and desperately needing a Sabbath space before they themselves give way. Father, whose son healed on the Sabbath, we pray that your healing hand may be stretched out this day. So we come to you our Father, bringing the words that Jesus himself taught us and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As the Lord has given to us, so we now give back to him. We will now take our morning offering. Let us pray. Creator God, you made us for yourself. You gave us life and breath. You gave us gifts to use. You gave us the Sabbath and called us to rest in you. And now we give back to you. Take these gifts and use them for the furthering of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn is one that sends us out uh, to do the Lord's work. For those using a hymn book, you can find it in uh, South Street Praise and Worship. It's number 167, and it's also on our screens. Sent by the Lord am I. So in the spirit of that hymn, we continue to pray that our Sabbath practice of coming together in worship would spill over to our lives. God of our pilgrimage, you have led us to the living water. Refresh and sustain us as we go forward on our journey. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us this morning, this day, and always. Amen. Amen.